Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Dill. I am a faculty member in the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and I help co-organize this seminar along with uh, Chris Monsier and Rob Bertini. So I welcome everyone. A couple uh, logistical stuff before I introduce our speaker. I want to remind everyone that we do webcast the seminar, so people watch it both live and archived on the web. And because of that, we ask that you use these microphones when you do ask questions so that, that your question is recorded. And regarding questions, um, if you could this time definitely wait until the end of the presentation to um, ask questions. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Bob Courtright from the uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development talking about the transportation planning rule and particularly some amendments that um, he is working on. So, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you all for showing up today. Um, I'm going to try to compress three presentations into about 45 minutes so I can leave some time for questions for you. Um, I'm going to try to cover three things. First, to give you a bit of background on the transportation planning rule, where it's been and what it's about. Second, to talk to you about uh, a report that we did last year that focuses on a portion of the rule that deals with planning in metropolitan areas. And then third, to talk to what Jennifer was alluding to, uh, a series of amendments that are under consideration by our commission and that will be over the next year. Um, first of all, a little bit of background on the transportation planning rule. I'd summarize the objectives uh, as being twofold. First, to try to do a better job of planning for land use and transportation together so that there's a balance between what land use plans call for and uh, an adequate transportation system. The second thing we want to do uh, that is a directive in the rule is to do more to plan for alternative modes of transportation, and really in two ways, both in the way that we plan land use in communities so that alternative modes are more viable, and to specifically do more planning for those alternative modes as part of transportation planning. Uh, let me just take a quick time out and tell you, um, I have a tendency to talk really fast, so I hope you'll be able to follow that, um, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of material, as I mentioned. So. This all started uh, in about 1990. Uh, if you think of the history of Oregon's land use planning program, uh, in the 70s, uh, goals were adopted. In the 80s, comprehensive plans. The first set of comprehensive plans were done. And at the end of the 80s, we started to say, uh, what does or what do all of these comprehensive plans that have been done add up to? What are they getting? Uh, and so we did an urban growth management study that looked at how plans were working around the state. And what we found was comprehensive plans were doing a good job of containing urban growth, but that the style of development that was occurring within urban growth boundaries was really not significantly different than was occurring in other parts of the country. Somewhat higher densities, uh, a little, again, contained, but the pattern of growth was very similar. And we looked at transportation planning as well, and what we found was that uh, really, communities decided what they wanted in the way of land use first, and transportation was done later. Uh, the result was a scattered pattern of land use, a poorly developed network of transportation, particularly streets, and that, the effect of that was to reinforce auto-dependent development patterns. The result um, that we were seeing uh, in the late 80s and early 90s was a pretty dramatic growth in the use of the automobile. Uh, in that 15 years between 1975 and 1990, the first 15 years of the land use planning program, automobile travel per person grew 50% faster than did the population. So people were driving much more than they were 15 years earlier. The conclusion that our commission reached was that without additional planning, without doing planning differently in Oregon, uh, particularly our metropolitan areas, we're going to face major transportation-related growth problems that would really affect the state's livability and cause traffic congestion and worsen air quality problems. So in 1991, uh, 15 years ago, uh, the commission, 14 years ago, the commission adopted the transportation planning rule. Its basic directive was to develop transportation system plans, plans that would plan for an adequate transportation system to serve planned land use, particularly to do more planning for local streets and alternative modes, and also to look at land use codes, that is, the zoning and development ordinances, and how those ordinances affected transportation. In 1993, a program that I work for, the Transportation and Growth Management Program, was created. It's a joint program between the Department of Land Conservation and Development, the Land Use Agency, and the Oregon Department of Transportation. 
Over the last 10 years, we've spent about $30 million uh, helping local governments update both their transportation and land use plans to implement the transportation planning rule. So uh, here's a snapshot of where we are uh, as a result of uh, the transportation planning rule. Most communities in Oregon now have detailed transportation plans to match their future land use plans. Uh, there's much more planning for new roads and streets to support development as well as improvements. Better planning for walking, bike routes, and, and uh, improvements. We've changed a lot of the existing zoning codes to make new development more pedestrian friendly and think about transportation as land use occurs. And there's much more in the way of local planning for improvements to the local transportation system. I'm going to go through those in a little bit more detail. Uh, again, the transportation system plans basically match that future vision of land use. Twenty years into the future, we have a picture of what uh, those future needs are going to be. There's also been a lot of work by local governments to uh, increase funding of local transportation improvements as new development occurs. Uh, when you look at the details of how transportation planning is done, there's more being done to plan for and better connect local streets a pretty basic part of making communities more transit, pedestrian, and bicycle friendly is thinking about how local streets, not just the arterials and collectors, uh, line up. So uh, both development ordinances and local plans are doing a better job of connecting streets. Um, again, better planning for bike and pedestrian facilities, following up on broad mandates at the state level to do more on those things. Uh, we have much more detailed planning for that. Uh, there's also been a change in the way that uh, local governments think about local streets. Again, more street connections and street design that really uh, encourages and supports higher density and alternative modes. Transit, we've seen uh, over the last 15 years pretty significant expansion in transit service. Uh, communities are planning new service, and there's better coordination between land use and transit than there was 15 years ago. At the land use level, I think you can look around the state and see most communities looking inward, looking at their downtowns and saying, we're interested in revitalizing and redeveloping their plans, their downtowns, uh, transportation planning to support that. And we're seeing a growing amount around the state of more innovative planning, of communities thinking about more than that typical uh, rural subdivision, uh, suburban subdivision pattern, thinking more about mixed use. On the ground, uh, there's more innovation. Uh, it's not as widespread as we might like, but it is starting to happen. And there are improvements in walkability in the way that suburban development is occurring. So uh, not to let you think that we've solved all the problems, let me highlight for you the issues that we highlighted for our commission last year when we made this presentation. The first is that the underlying plans that were in place uh, in the 1990s are still there, and they are land use plans that pretty much call for a continuation of highway and auto-oriented development patterns. They continue the historic patterns of development. Transportation system plans didn't change that or didn't require communities to change land use. So what we really have is TSPs that reflect a continuation of that pattern. Um, second thing that we've noticed is that as communities have done transportation system plans, they tend to rely on the state, that is ODOT, uh, to make large highway improvements to solve their transportation problems. It's easy to assume, there's no reason not to assume, that the state will not uh, come in and build a big highway to help solve your problem. And it tends to divert communities from thinking about other ways they might solve their problems. Uh, by making improvements to local roads or streets, or by changing land use patterns so that that uh, big highway improvement isn't needed. The other thing, and I'll get to this again in the presentation, is there's a pretty substantial gap between what transportation system plans call for in the way of planned improvements and what uh, we are likely to afford in the way of future transportation uh, funding. Uh, in red, you can see the deficit that we calculated back in 2000 between what transportation system plans adopted by metropolitan areas called for and the likely revenues. And let me just give you a quick picture. That future forecast of revenue assumed that the gas tax would rise about 25 cents uh, from what it currently was or what it was at that time. Um, it hasn't gotten there yet and is not likely to. So uh, that assumes a pretty healthy increase in transportation revenue, um, and you can see there's a pretty substantial gap. Uh, the other thing is th that there is a mismatch between the way, continues to be a mismatch between the way communities think about land use or regulate land use and the way we plan for transportation. 
Transportation system plans are based on averages, assumptions about what future land use is going to be. But actual zoning ordinances adopted locally tend to allow much more intense uses that are assumed, uh, particularly in commercial zones. You could have a doctor's office that generates just a few trips on the transportation system. You could have a fast food restaurant that generates even more. Um, and those averages work out, but um, that can result in some unintended consequences for the transportation system. The other thing we found, and again, I'll get to this later in the presentation, is that the way the rules are structured, we allow plan amendments uh, that would continue uh, the existing pattern of development, that suburban pattern of development. Basically, where there's adequate transportation capacity, a community can upzone property, can allow more intense development. So at fringe areas around our urban growth boundaries, we tend to get uh, low density development that can capture that available cap capacity of the transportation system. By contrast, areas closer in are viewed as congested or up to capacity, and upzoning uh, is not preferred, at least in terms of the way the rules are set up. And when I s refer to the rules, it's both the transportation planning rule and the Oregon Highway Plan, uh, which sets the standards of performance for the state highway system. Um, another issue we identified for our commission is interchanges. Um, both in terms of the integrity of the state's transportation system and the potential for pretty significant land use changes. Um, that is an issue that we anticipate working on with the Department of Transportation over the next several years. So uh, we also identified that, that there are a series of opportunities. If we want communities to change land use patterns, uh, there are some things that we need to do differently. First is to recognize that planning the way that we do it needs to be done in a more detailed fashion. Comprehensive planning and zoning are basically enabling. They identify where development can happen and identify it broadly. But to make compact or mixed-use development happen, there really has to be another layer or level of planning uh, and really a public-private partnership uh, to get to the details of the kind of plan that you see illustrated there. You also need the public to do more in the way of planning for the supporting public investments, uh, schools, parks, and infrastructure. Um, Another opportunity that we identified, and you probably see a lot here in the Portland metropolitan area, is the opportunity for infill and redevelopment in areas that are currently developed where we can uh, make more efficient use of the existing infrastructure. Uh, those are areas that have higher potential for increased alternative use of alternative modes. Uh, another opportunity was coordinating land use planning where we're making major public investments. Light rail here in the Portland area is probably the best example of that. But it's something that we can do with all transportation investments to think carefully about the land use pattern that that can support and how to make use of that. Um, also to think more about innovative planning tools and opportunities. Uh, in the Portland metropolitan area, there's a little bit more uh, sophistication. Most of Oregon is more rural, small city, um, and really doesn't have quite all of those tools. So sharing a lot of the things that have been developed here is something we see as an opportunity uh, to improve planning in the state. Um, street design and the land use connection, this is where you're starting to get to the details of where land use and transportation line up on the ground. Uh, do more to bring together public works departments at the local level that are doing the street planning and management with the zoning and planning people so that we actually build in transportation choices. Okay, that ends the broad overview of the transportation planning rule. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about metropolitan planning because the transportation planning rule sets separate requirements for the state's metropolitan areas, and those are Portland, Salem, Eugene Springfield, Medford, and we have two new metropolitan areas, uh, Corvallis and Bend. So uh, last year we went through and did an evaluation of this portion of the rule. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on it and then walk you through what the results of that evaluation were. The 1991 rule set a specific requirement for metropolitan areas, or MPOs. It said, over the next 20 years, we want you to plan for a 10% reduction in VMT, that's vehicle miles traveled per capita. So when you look and project where you're going to be 20 years from now, plan so that people have alternative transportation choices and that you expect the outcome will be reduced uh, vehicle travel. It focused on the outcome reduced vehicle travel. It left it up to each metropolitan area to figure out what mix of efforts changing land use or adding alternative modes would be used. This was on top of those requirements that I went through before, which deal with 
better planning for alternative modes, as well as doing planning for transportation demand management, parking, and uh, making changes to land use codes. In 1998, we did an evaluation of that rule and the efforts to implement it. And the two basic conclusions were that the target that we had set, a 10% reduction in VMT, was overly aggressive. Um, but it also found that the mix of actions that are available to uh, local governments or regional governments to achieve any reduction in vehicle travel were essentially known, and, and they are, changing land use to get higher densities, particularly around uh, transit, um, expanding transit service, making improvements in alternative modes, and doing more to create uh, transportation demand management programs. So later that year, the Commission adopted amendments to the rule that lowered that target for metropolitan areas for 10, from 10 percent to 5 percent. It allowed alternative standards, that is, things other than VMT to be the measure of whether or not the rule would be met. And it also said we need to do more in every metropolitan area to think about land use and transportation together in the form of an integrated land use and transportation plan. So this year we did, or last year we did, a report assessing how well this most recent set of amendments worked. And we looked in three areas, planning for alternative modes, adoption of alternative standards, and then the integration of land use and transportation plans. What we found with alternative modes is that there's generally good progress in all of our metropolitan areas. Um, there's more planning for and provision of alternative modes as a matter of course in the way that transportation planning is done. There's more detailed planning for bikes and peds. Again, there's more investment. We also found, however, that there's room for improvement, especially at strategies that tie investments with uh, land use strategies, to think about um, making investments not simply that complete that last link in the bike system, but that support uh, land use patterns that communities want to achieve. On alternative standards, again, this is the option of doing something other than VMT to measure local progress. Uh, we left it up to local governments to come, or regional governments actually, to come up forward with uh, alternative standards. All four of our major metropolitan areas have opted for that. Three have them approved. Salem's still in progress. Uh, the switch is, instead of measuring the outcome, there's much more of an emphasis on measuring efforts. That is, the things that we expect will have uh, an effect on reducing reliance on the automobile. Uh, and they typically are measuring investments, particularly investments and improvements in alternative modes. Uh, increases in transit service as a measure of providing alternative modes, and then land use changes, particularly targeting uh, either population or employment for areas where you would expect that there are going to be higher rates of use of alternative modes of transportation or re reduced vehicle travel. So the third part of that was integrated land use and transportation plans. We found that, and just to describe what this is, it's typically a vision and strategy for a different land use plan that includes both a land use component for changing uh, land use plan designations and zoning designations, and a transportation component, which is the supporting investments in facilities and services and TDM measures. So the status is that Portland has met this requirement, basically through the 2040 plan and the framework plan and the subsequent implementation efforts. Uh, what we found is what we call the downstate areas, again, Salem, Eugene, and Medford, uh, are further behind. Uh, Eugene and Medford have both adopted broad strategies and are working on implementing them. Salem's still working on what the strategy would be. Um, we think the metropolitan Portland experience is uh, instructive about what's necessary to make this work. Uh, communities really need to identify their centers, particularly for mixed-use development. They need to target future population and employment to those centers, and then start to make changes to planning and zoning to support those, and then do detailed transportation planning, dealing with street design, street connectivity, and alternative modes. And then finally, to target transportation investments to those areas to make those things happen. We also find that, found that there are barriers. This doesn't just happen. Um, resources is a big factor, funding and organization. Uh, the, again, the Portland metropolitan area is ahead in each of those areas in terms of targeting resources and funding to make this happen and being better organized than are the smaller metropolitan areas. Uh, we also found that new tools are needed. Again, this isn't simply planning for development and letting it happen. The public has more of a role to play in providing financial incentives uh, and helping move the market into this direction. 
Uh, another barrier is, barrier is there tends to be less consensus in the downstate areas about uh, making land use changes as a way to address these problems, in part because the congestion and growth problems are not viewed as severe in those other areas. Uh, we heard some uh, issues and concerns from the metropolitan areas, again, always that uh, the TPR is uh, overly ambitious in terms of making these changes, uh, consequently that they need more time and resources and tools. Uh, there's a concern that reduced reliance, which is the term of art that's used in the rule, creates a regulatory tension uh, that we're trying to get people out of their automobiles as opposed to increased transportation options. And there's also uh, a friendly uh, note that state policies aren't necessarily in alignment. That is, LCDC is telling people to reduce reliance on the automobile or plan for alternative modes, but other parts of state rules make uh, achieving that difficult. Um, we also identified a couple of other big issues and concerns. One, again, that I mentioned earlier, which is the funding gap, uh, that we have significantly more plant projects planned than we are likely to have revenue for. And we also noted, uh, with, and metropolitan areas agreed, that the employment and housing markets that they're dealing with spread well beyond their borders, that we have a large number of uh, small and medium-sized communities that are outside of the metropolitan boundaries where we have spillover growth and lots of commuting uh, that create real issues that we need to think about dealing with. So our conclusions were that our efforts in the Portland area are really showing success. The other metropolitan areas are not as far along for a variety of reasons. At the same time, uh, we think that planning for transportation options remains a critical issue. Again, because there's that funding gap there, things are not going to get better in our metropolitan areas. Uh, and growing recognition that this is a public health issue, that building in uh, opportunities for active community is important to dealing with public health issues. Um, also, that making changes to land use is really a long-term strategy. We don't change the structure of communities overnight. It's a long-term proposition. Uh, more time is consequently warranted. Uh, but also that we should think carefully about the actions that we take in the short term. Uh, again, our existing pattern of zoning allows a continuation of lower density development. We want to make sure that new plans, plant new plan amendments and new investments are supporting changes instead of just a continuation of that pattern. So we identified a series of options uh, for our commission to consider. These are ones that will be rolled into the rulemaking process that I'll describe in just a moment. Um, to extend the schedule for doing integrated land use and transportation plans, uh, to change the emphasis, again, away from reduced reliance to planning for transportation options, and to think more carefully about those interim actions that would affect uh, the direction that we're going. So the third thing I wanted to talk to you about is what I'm doing now, which is the transportation planning rule evaluation. Uh, and this is a broader effort by both uh, the Transportation Commission and the Land Conservation and Development Commission, which are the policy-making bodies for our two agencies uh, that are looking at the transportation planning rule. Uh, we started this process last fall. Uh, we're doing it in two phases. The first phase is what I'll call JQA. The second phase is dealing with other issues. And we're currently in rulemaking on JQA, and I'll describe that for you. Uh, section 060 is, or 0060 is one particular section of the rule. It deals with plan amendments. So a community is considering a change to its existing comprehensive plan. The rule requires uh, basically that when a community changes its plan, it has to make sure there's a balance between the allowed land uses and the transportation system. Or put another way, that the transportation facilities are adequate to support the planned land use. Um, and this, again, section applies to plan amendments and zone changes. It's not something that applies to just routine uh, development approvals at the local level. So what a community has to do is assess whether or not a plan amendment or zone change significantly affects the transportation system. If it decides there is a significant effect, then it has to take steps to put land use and transportation in balance, either by adding planned transportation facilities or <laughs> limiting the land uses or doing something to say we're going to tolerate more congestion than we otherwise would on the transportation system. That's the performance standards change. Um, a significant effect occurs basically when you would cause increased traffic over what's otherwise allowed by the transportation plan. And that's usually measured in two ways. At the local level, it's measured on local streets by level of service standards, which are grades from A to F. Typically, if you're an E or an F, you're uh, violating the level of service standard. 
And on the highway standards, it's a volume to capacity ratio, so it's an actual number that succeeded. Uh, those performance standards are set by ODOT for state highways uh, and uh, in the highway plan and by local governments through their TSPs. And the evaluation is based on the facilities that are called for in the plan. So last year, uh, the Court of Appeals issued a ruling in the case called, a case called Jaqua versus City of Springfield. Uh, it upheld a LUBA uh, de determination from earlier in the year. And basically, what Jaqua found was a significant effect occurs if at any point over the next 20 years, which is the planning period, a transportation facility would fail to meet that performance standard. So if your level of service is E and you have F at any point over that 20-year period, then the court ruling was that uh, there was a significant effect that triggers that obligation under the transportation planning rule. Uh, what a lot of people thought was that the way the TPR worked was you only measured at year 20, that is at the end of the planning period. And the effect of the court opinion was that you had to measure, again, continuously over the planning period, which created a lot of consternation at the development community about whether or not that was doable and whether or not the effect was to create, in essence, a concurrency requirement. So what we've been wrestling with is how to make that change. There are really two policy levers or questions here. One is that question of when do you measure uh, the transportation performance, and then second is what improvements do you count in deciding whether or not the transportation system is going to be uh, operating uh, adequately. Uh, and the rules amendments deal with two other issues, uh, interstate interchanges and failing facilities. I'll deal with that, those in just a moment. So the first change we proposed was changing when performance is measured uh, to go back to what we think was the common understanding, which is you measure a whether or not there's going to be a significant effect at the end of the planning period. Again, typically 10 to 20 years out. Um, so that's one change we'd make. That, the effect of that would be to reverse the, the JQA decision. It would also be to effectively allow plan amendments, <coughs> excuse me, allow plan amendments that would result in congestion over uh, the 20 year planning period uh, that might only be corrected at the end of the planning period. At the same time, we recognize that individual local governments, cities and counties, could adopt more restrictive standards. They aren't obligated to approve those plan amendments. They could even adopt concurrency requirements. Uh, the second thing we did is define the list of facilities that local governments could count in deciding whether or not those performance standards are met. And basically, it's where there's a funding commitment of some sort in place. And we've defined what those funding commitments are. First. There's some sort of funding plan as part of that state or local transportation system plan. In metropolitan areas, they include a financially constrained transportation uh, system plan that is based on, again, that revenue estimate that I talked about. Um, and then the third option that we gave was where either ODOT for state highways or the relevant local government says in writing that it's reasonably likely that that facility will be built at the end of the 20-year planning period. The effect of that, we think, is that it's going to limit uh, what improvements local governments rely on. It won't be that whole set of improvements that are called for in the transportation system plan. Um, and the important policy response there, we think, is to address what's been called the polite fiction. This is the term that Luba and the Court of Appeals both used in their uh, decisions. Uh, the polite fiction being that transportation system plans are expecting all of these revenues to show up and whether or not it's reasonable to rely on those for land use purposes. The rule recommends uh, some different requirements at interstate interchanges, basically recognizing the special significance of interchanges to the state highway system. Um, so there's tighter standards there that basically say you can only rely on improvements that are currently funded or there's a clear funding commitment of some type. It doesn't allow for that judgment about whether or not things are reasonably likely except where ODOT agrees that there's no significant adverse effect. Um, we think that that will uh, make it more likely that plan amendments or zone changes at interchange areas will be subject to review. It will trigger more coordination between ODOT and local governments and applicants to address how improvements at interchanges will be funded and will create an incentive, hopefully, for development away from interchanges so that, that we don't affect their operation.
Um, finally, there's a provision for exemption for failing facilities, simply recognizing that a lot of our transportation system is currently over capacity, and it would allow uh, an exception to, for plan amendments where a facility is failing, where it's not expected to be fixed at the end of the planning period, and the applicant shows that they're going to otherwise mitigate and improve the operation of the system. So that's uh, a final provision that's there. Expected effect is to allow some additional development where applicants provide mitigation. Uh, the concern is that it may allow uh, applicants to capture the benefit of low-cost improvements, such as signals or turn lanes. Those may be the next thing that the public would do to improve operation of the system. So there's some concern that the, the easy fixes might be captured for the benefit of additional development as opposed to improving operation of the system. Um, I mentioned that we're doing this in two phases. Here's a quick rundown of the other issues that we expect to be addressing. Um, the other thing I'd note is we're currently uh, in the process of rulemaking. Our commission is holding a hearing next week uh, and has a second hearing scheduled for March to adopt that first package of amendments that I, went, that I mentioned. Uh, the other issues that we're looking at uh, as part of the joint subcommittee between the two commissions are first the mobility standards. Those are the standards in the highway plan for measuring performance of the state highway system. Uh, again, from the MPO report, you'll remember, there's some concern that those standards in the highway plan are too high in some areas, that they restrict the ability of communities to uh, implement mixed-use development or higher densities in areas that it's appropriate. So we expect that the Transportation Commission will look at changes to the mobility standards to allow for more urban-centered development, more mixed-use development. Second, it deals with implementation of highway segment designations. I'll try not to go into too much detail of that. This is another technique that the Department of Transportation is using to adjust the way it manages highways to support compatible land use patterns, especially in downtowns and smaller communities around the state. Um, the third is an amendment to the transportation planning rule to try to deal with the different sizes of communities and their different capabilities. We have a lot of very small communities in Oregon. Um, we want to make the rules as simple and clear for them as we can and not create additional requirements. Um, I mentioned the policy of changing uh, reduced reliance on the automobile. That is a phrase that uh, creates concern on the part of many local government officials to be friendlier about improving transportation options. Um, uh, number five and six are making changes to the way the rule deals with uh, project development. We've got those plans that call for transportation projects. We want actual development and construction of projects to be simpler in terms of the way it's treated in the land use process. Um, Goal 14 is the urban growth boundary goal, and uh, one of the things that we struggle with is how to better coordinate transportation planning uh, at the urban fringe when communities are planning uh, major urban growth boundary expansions. There are major expansions here in the Portland metropolitan area. Basically, metros made a decision where to expand the urban growth boundary. Now the question is, how will that area be served with transportation facilities? Uh, and that issue hasn't been looked at in detail in the Urban Growth Boundary Amendment, um, and we expect to do more to say how that process ought to be coordinated. Eighth is that big, bigger issue of transportation finance and funding. How do we uh, deal with uh, this huge gap between what plans call for and what is likely to be uh, uh, occur? Uh, number nine is uh, the TPR includes broad objectives, again, to change land use and to reduce reliance on the automobile. Uh, to be clearer about what's aspirational in the rule and what are actually requirements of local government. Finally, is uh, rolling back to what I talked about a few minutes ago, the issues in metropolitan areas. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, and I think I'm close to squeezing into the time that I wanted to get this done. And so I'm open to your questions on any or all of that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the points you make about the gap between transportation plans and funding is something that is always front and center because people look at these great plans for all these wonderful facilities, but a lot of times it never comes out. Um, is there maybe a sort of a movement to make smaller plans that focus on what actually can be done as opposed to making larger plans that sort of a little bit more of a pie in the sky? Yes, and I mentioned that we have for the metropolitan areas, there's a federal requirement that requires a financially constrained plan. And I think that was really what that was targeted at, was 
a look nationally at the way planning was done said, everybody's doing this. They're being overly optimistic that Congress is going to write a check to solve their problems and that there should be more discipline in the process so that people are more realistic about the choices they make. That's been partially successful. Um, one of the things that we expect as a result of the amendments that we're making is that uh, communities will go back and amend their transportation system plans to adopt a list within a list. That is, they'll have a short list of here are the things that are reasonably likely to be funded in the next 20 years. Um, that's a start. Um, I think the bigger question that's lurking there is, well, if those are the things that we're going to do in the next 20 years, how does that affect us realizing our land use vision? And you know, should the community be thinking differently about land use or zoning as a result? I mean, that's the underlying objective of the rule, is to put land use and transportation in balance. And if we aren't realistic uh, about how land use and finance uh, uh, you know, match up, are we really achieving that objective? Yes? Um, I hope I'm not uh, opening up a can of worms, but can you talk a little bit about 37? Measure 37. Yeah, I was going to list that. Uh, you know, I went through the issues that we face, and I did the presentation last mm -hmm. June before uh, Measure 37 was adopted. Um, I think that's a bigger question mark for the land use program. I think you know the state is currently in the process, and local governments are, of getting claims. Uh, most of those tend to be in rural areas, and I think most of those tend to be for, I mean, there are a few for major developments outside of urban areas. I think it remains to be seen whether or not any of those are likely to move forward. Uh, so I think it's mostly a question for uh, protection of resource lands. Uh, I can tell you at both the state and local level, I think it's really chilled uh, any efforts to adopt new land use regulations for fear it's going to trigger a new set of claims. Um, that's about all anybody can say right now about it. Uh, I think the general view is the measure is written uh, less than precisely and uh, is likely going to be changed or clarified by either the courts or the legislature. Yes? Can you briefly describe what, what exactly JQA is? Okay. Um, JQA was a, is a LUBA appeal, but it was an appeal of a decision by the city of Springfield to amend its comprehensive plan for a regional hospital. Basically, it's the Peace Health Hospital moving out of uh, an area between downtown and the University of Oregon and Eugene out to the fringe in Springfield. It would be a major regional uh, medical facility. And the challenge that the JQA made, Jake was made was uh, that there were transportation impacts from moving that facility out that weren't adequately addressed uh, by the city of Springfield in making that plan amendment. Yes? Um, do you see an implementation issue? Or, uh, actually, do you see a continuing implementation issue for local plans without increased funds from ODOT and a lack of TSP requirements? Yes, I mean, I think that's one of the big questions that's out there is right now TSPs include a lot of promises. I mean, if you go to a TSP, you're going to see projects that, you know, meet a whole different, whole set of, bunch of different sets of needs or opportunities. Um, which ones either ODOT selects to implement or that local communities select to implement are really going to shape what land use in Oregon communities look like or going to shape... Um, the kind of transportation system we have. So it's not clear from either the land use plans or the transportation plans we have exactly what the future is going to look like. Uh, again, it's going to be shaped by decisions about investments in transportation. Yes? It seems like a lot of new communities that are developing are following all these standards, but what's being done for the well-established communities to start obtaining these goals without completely re designing themselves? I, I think that it's slower, and it depends. I mean, you see it probably here more in the Portland metropolitan area than you do anywhere else in the state, is when there's a constraint on where future development can go, then communities start to look uh, at the other opportunities. It's more expensive and more difficult to redevelop an area that's already been developed. I mean, the development community is looking at the fixed costs of uh, you know, getting a plan amendment and getting an approval in place and making a change. It's easier to deal with greenfield property at the edge of the urban growth boundary uh, 
Uh, it's easier to get a loan on that. The costs of um, doing those things are much lower. So that's why the public role is much more important for the public to say we want that to happen and to make the supporting public investments. And I think more and more communities around the state are doing that. And I pointed out that there was a slide showing the downtowns. Is most communities have at least adopted an aspiration that says, gee, we really want downtown to be a more vital place. We want more businesses there. It's the heart of the community. And you can see the start of efforts to make that happen. Um, Astoria is a good example. Uh, they're starting to create urban renewal districts in these smaller communities uh, and bringing public investments. Um, and the role of the state highway in community like that, a lot of communities around the state is, you know, the main street is a state highway. So the state has a really important role in how it manages uh, and plans for the future of the highway is those storefront businesses that are really the essence of a main street in a downtown are going to succeed or fail in large part on how the highway is planned and managed or at least it's very important to making that happen. So I think that's, those are the starting points for a lot of communities to start to uh, make those things happen. Yes? I was curious about why 10% was chosen as the VMT reduction goal back in 1991, and then with the 1998 amendments, what other standards are being used besides VMT for measurement? Okay. Um, I, I think it was just a general sense of we wanted a clear and objective target to measure. That was the, the most important thing. 10% uh, seemed to line up with uh, a general sense of what was doable and that would begin to make a difference. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, looking as we did in 1997, 98, when we looked at the rule, um, what we were hearing from Metro, which was the farthest along, was they said it was doable for the Portland metropolitan area. And I'm trying to remember, and maybe other folks know, uh, whether or not it's come close uh, in terms of actually achieving that objective. Um, the other thing I want to say is we knew we were, uh, to some extent, picking a number uh, and selecting 10 percent. Um, and that's one of the reasons the Commission committed to evaluate in 1997 and actually at periodic intervals afterwards is we knew that we were setting a pretty basic change in policy and uh, we weren't certain what was attainable and wanted to make sure that it was both reasonable and realistic. And uh, so that's why we made the adjustment. The second part of your question is what other measures have people put forward? And I think most of them have been a composite of measuring, again, not the outcomes, not the result in the way that uh, vehicle travel, but more measuring the inputs. And the reason for that is local governments feel like, well, we can't control how much people drive or choose not to. There are a lot of other factors that affect that. What you, the state, ought to measure is the things that we can control. Well, we can control how much we spend on bike improvements or pedestrian improvements. What percentage of the uh, bike network that our 20-year plan calls for are we building each five years? Um, how many of our new residences are within uh, a five-minute walk of a transit stop? That's another typical kind of measure. Um, how much of our new population and employment is in centers or neighborhoods that are transit or pedestrian friendly? Um, so it's more those, uh, those kind of measures uh, that deal with the things that local government control, can control that uh, local governments have shifted to. Yes? Has there been any consideration of um, alternative engineering techniques, for example, second generation traffic calming, things like that? Um, I think that's certainly supporting. I will tell you that in most of the state, uh, and, and I alluded this, to this a little bit, is land use planning and transportation planning are done by separate shops and local government. The land use planning is done by land use planners in this office, and the planning for the transportation system is done by the public works guys that are in another office. So the the marriage of land use and transportation planning to a large extent has been a shotgun marriage uh, between two very different views of, of this and who's responsible for what. Um, I think there's been more and more of that. We have done it mostly through directing communities to plan for street connections, um, which is typically done at the subdivision or development approval level, so that's the land use planning shop. Um, and it's also dealt with street standards, which immediately starts to get into engineering, as we've required communities to uh, 
uh, reduce their residential street widths. They're, before the rule was adopted, they were generally 34 to 36 feet in most communities, and we advocate something on the order of 28 feet, both to support more efficient ur use of urban land and to create a street that's more friendly to uh, alternative modes of transportation. Um, and that's been a difficult thing to do in a lot of communities, is people, for one reason or another, don't like uh, the state telling them what to do with residential streets. At the same time, I think we see, especially with connectivity, that commu more communities are dealing with street calming uh, devices and measures. Uh, and part of that is the street design issue, is if you make a street overly wide, you're kind of inviting traffic to go uh, faster. Um, and that generates a lot of the concerns that lead to traffic calming. Um, part of it has to do with the community and where they're at in terms of perceiving that as an issue and where their public works people are at addressing it. Yes? What has the initial response been from local cities and counties outside the metro areas to this revision and evaluation of the TPR? Well, we haven't received a whole lot of response yet. This is to the, the JAQA proposed plan amendments. Uh, I think the biggest concern that we hear from local governments is, boy, that's going to be difficult for us to uh, make this decision about which projects are reasonably likely to be funded. If you think about it, that TSP includes everybody's project right now, and making the decision that somebody's project is going to be funded and somebody else's isn't um, is you know, saying somebody isn't going to get what they want, and that's probably a very difficult decision to make. Um, but, I mean, at some point we have to address that, uh, that polite fiction of what is going to get funded and what isn't. Yes. Can you give some more information about the regulatory um, tension with respect to the reduced reliance termage? Yeah, I, I think the perception that, again, in metropolitan areas that most local <coughs> officials have is they think it's fine for government to provide options to say, let's give people, especially it's dealing with commuting and how people get to work. It's fine to provide free bus passes or uh, make investments in bikes and ped improvements so that people have other ways to get to work or to provide for transit. The reduced reliance on the automobile is perceived as you're forcing people to make other choices, um, that we're basically telling them they sh can't or they shouldn't drive their automobile or that in some way the automobile is ba inherently bad and should be avoided. And so it just it creates a tension uh, or a less reception for what we think the rule is really after, which is do you plan your community in a way that makes those options real and available for people so that they choose them um, or not? Um, really, it's just a way of measuring uh, how well we're doing in providing options, not something that we're trying to force communities to do. We have a question from a web viewer. So Yes. Um, can system development charge revenue collected by local governments be shared with ODOT for improvements to state highways, or is it limited to local roads? And part two, how is SDC revenue related to con concurrency? Oh, good questions. I'm not sure. There's probably a legal question about whether or not SDC revenue, that systems development charges that are collected by a city or county, can be used for a state facility. I think there are some situations where local governments have entered into intergovernmental agreements with ODOT to do just that, to take systems development charge monies and target them to an improvement on the state highway. Um, but there may be some question about exactly the legal mechanics to make that happen. So I don't have a great answer to, to that part of the question. Uh, can you repeat the second part for me? How is SDC revenue related to concurrency? Um, there are only a couple of cities in Oregon that have concurrency requirements. Uh, Wilsonville is one. Clackamas County has a partial uh, systems development charge. I'm, I'm not sure that there's a specific relationship. Uh, SDCs are generally collected to fund all of those planned improvements that are called for, or most of them that are called for, on the local system and the transportation system plan. Uh, concurrency may sa says basically there have to be adequate facilities in place for you, for your development to be permitted uh, or move forward. Um, generally what will happen as a result of that is somebody will have to make uh, an improvement or help fund an improvement in order for their development to go ahead. 
Um, and often or typically that, that expenditure on making an improvement to meet the concurrency requirement is debited against what might otherwise be charged in a system development charge. Um, I'm not sure if that's all what the question is about, but uh, let me leave it at that. Jennifer? Can I follow up just because on the concurrency issue? Because a couple times you alluded to sort of this fear of JQA turning into uh, concurrency. And so maybe if you could just discuss sort of why the negative aspects of concurrency or why that would be a bad thing. And, and is any of that gleaned from experience in other states that do have concurrency requirements? Or? Um, when the transportation planning rules adopted in 1991, there was some discussion about whether or not we should require concurrency. That is, do the facilities have to be in, in place now or within a, a short period of time, a few years, uh, before the development is approved? And I think the big concern or the general concern, and this is borne out by Florida, who probably has the most experience uh, with this, is it tends to push development outward. If you think about it, if you, it's fine to say you ought not allow land use except where there's adequate transportation facilities. But again, uh, the nature of things is that facilities in the urban area tend to be congested. They tend to not have additional capacity. Uh, at the fringe, there tends to be more capacity, or particularly at freeway interchanges, it's relatively easy to add uh, at least an increment of capacity. Um, we don't necessarily want development to spread out to the edge of the metropolitan area. So that's a concern that concurrency would have that effect of pushing or making areas out at the fringe that happen to have capacity uh, more likely to receive growth. Uh, Florida has actually changed its level of service standards, I think, a couple of times to recognize that that's the effect of concurrency. They haven't thrown it out the window. They've said, we're going to tolerate more congestion in metropolitan or in the center of metropolitan areas because that's the nature of, of them and uh, we'll accept that and allow more development at the same time. And I think that's something that we're likely to do. We don't have concurrency requirements, but certainly the mobility standards that ODOT's adopted have that same kind of effect of saying we'll tolerate more congestion or we'll, we'll tolerate more development uh, at the urban fringe where we don't necessarily want it. Yes? Um, you mentioned the barrier of spillover growth and commuting. If you had to rank the metropolitan areas, where would you place them? I, I imagine Bend might be at, near the top. Um, it's hard to say, uh, to rank them because the scale of the metropolitan areas is so different. Um, the, I would say that the amount of commuting that occurs from the Portland metropolitan area to, to fringe communities is probably the highest. Uh, there's certainly a lot of concern with Bend, which has gone from you know, a community of about uh, 30, 40,000 to a metropolitan area and having a lot of effect on the surrounding uh, communities. There's a lot more commuting. Um, so it, it's hard to measure it. I'd say it's more important, I think, to talk about it and what its implications are, is we're not really prepared to handle it, uh, either from a land use perspective or from a transportation perspective. The metropolitan areas are really just dealing with the uh, jurisdictions within their boundary. They don't have any uh, jurisdictional or there isn't really any planning that is addressing uh, that commuting and how it's occurring. And on the land use side, uh, we're getting pressure from those outlying communities to expand their urban growth boundaries. Uh, and there really isn't a lot of conscious thought about, well, how much of that growth is commuting or how much of that growth is appropriate, uh, given that it would be from commuting. And then what are its implications for the state highway system if we have lots of commuters uh, clogging up the state highways? Uh, what are those, the impacts on freight mobility and economic development? So those are big questions and are likely to get bigger uh, as growth occurs. Yes? You mentioned that uh, every, instead of looking at the plans after 20 years, you would look at, at after maybe 5, 10, 15 increments. If they don't meet the standards, what, um, what is to be done and do they rewrite plans and so forth? Um, it, it's an ongoing process. I mean, I, again, I was talking about uh, particularly Eugene and Medford and Salem is they're kind of in progress. They've adopted broad visions that say, yes, we would like to have a more vibrant downtown and we have identified these areas that we think are good for uh, some sort of mixed-use center. Um, 
they're less far along in actually making changes to their comprehensive plans and zoning and their transportation plans to figure out how to make that happen. Um, and I think it's just an ongoing process. I think uh, one of the things that other people have observed about the state land use planning program is it's much easier to tell people that they can't develop farmland or forest land. It's easier to put restrictions on development than it is to make development happen. We can zone it so that it enables communities to make that happen, but uh, it requires a lot more effort. So it's not something that simply changing a rule is going to make happen. Uh, so I think it's really a dialogue with uh, ODOT in terms of the transportation investments it makes and with local governments to help provide them the tools and resources uh, to make whatever progress that they can. I mean, the other thing that's a factor here is the market, is we can really only move as fast as the market uh, is able to move. And the market is much more, much further along in terms of delivering different kinds of products in the Portland metropolitan area than it is in most of the other parts of the state. So those are all challenges uh, that you know, have to be factored into how quickly we can make those changes. Rob. Thank you for coming, and I had a quick question about resources, and I was on a city planning commission in California, and our city did a lot of very detailed, precise planning for particular neighborhoods, and the result has been, uh, especially after I left for some reason, that they've done a lot of great things with uh, targeting development toward transit and so on. Are there tools or resources for planning commissions and city staffs or cities who may not have staffs around <laughs> the state? It just seems like having some examples and case studies and templates for things that have worked uh, would be help helpful. And I know Jennifer has done some of that uh, work in the past, just thinking, is there more that should be done in that direction? Well, I, I had a quick slide in there about the Transportation and Growth Management Program, and that's, I think, really the resource that the state has provided to local communities to do this. Um, to tell you just a little bit more about it, most of the program is grants to communities to update their transportation system plans or look at land use and transportation together. Um, and that's about $6 million every two years that the state is spending to help local communities do that. And that comes out of federal transportation money. The other parts of the program are, I think, doing the sorts of things that you're talking about. We have an outreach program that generates publications um, and uh, does workshops with local communities. And the, and the purpose there is to familiarize local planning commissions, local elected officials with the successful techniques that are being used in other communities to make different kinds of development happen. Um, we have a quick response program, which is uh, to help communities that have a pending development proposal that they say, gee, this isn't quite what we want. Um, we'd really like to use this as an opportunity to think differently about how our community might develop. Um, and that's usually an ability the local governments don't have. I mean, when somebody comes in with a land use application in Oregon, you've got 120 days to review it and approve it. You're in essentially a quasi-judicial kind of role. Um, it doesn't create the kind of opportunity that you would want to take advantage of when a property owner who's going to develop their property walks in the door. There are real uh, opportunities there to think about how it fits into the fabric of community and plan, not just for that property, but for, again, fitting it into the surrounding neighborhood or uh, make it a community center instead of just an isolated development. The third program we have is called Code Assistance, and that's just recognizing, you know, you get the kind of development that your zoning and development ordinances allow. Um, and a lot of communities have codes that were written for suburban low-density development, so not a big surprise that that's what they get. Um, and we provide direct assistance to work with planning commissions and councils, again, to rewrite their codes so that they can get, uh, you know, the kind of development that they might want to have. So those programs are out there. Um, they're probably not as much as we would like, um, you know, and we're fighting with attention at the local level. Um, and it's a question of the amount of resources and ability that local government's able to put into addressing these issues. And it really varies. I think uh, our timing is perfect. We're right at about 1 o'clock, and I want to thank you. But before I do, I will also uh, remind people of next week's speaker, uh, John Carter from Imason Carter, uh, the topic being Thinking Big, New Finance and Contracting Options for Transportation Infrastructure. So, and thank you very much. Thank you.